This is our last panel of a very jam-packed uh, two-day event, and I'm grateful to everyone who has the stamina um, <laughs> to be here. So um, this is a roundtable on local anti-fascist activism. So a lot of the things that we've talked about over the last couple of days in theory or you know, that people have observed people doing, um, we actually have people here who are doing this work on the ground uh, from uh, the surrounding community. And um, I know that Long Island and suburbia in general at times gets a bad rap for being um, kind of a, a difficult place politically. And it often is, uh, but there is a lot of good work being done. And these are some of the people who are doing it. Some of our panelists uh, have been stuck in traffic. So we are going to start um, and they will join us up on the stage um, when they are able. So I'm going to introduce the chair, uh, the person who will be facilitating the roundtable discussion, and then I'm going to pass the baton to her for the rest of the event. And uh, that is my colleague, and now my friend, uh, Heather Bennett from Santa Monica College. So please uh, welcome Heather, and let's go. Um, so I've remained remarkably quiet, I think, through the conference, and now I'm going to be talking a lot. Uh, <laughs> so let me just in uh, let me introduce myself a little bit more. Uh, I earned a PhD from University of Pennsylvania, and I, my focus is modern Europe, um, and uh, I I did my research on. Um, the competing construction and competing narratives of the Paris Commune during the 1870s by politicians of the early Third Republic through which they defined themselves in front of the French electorate. So the use of memory politics, um, creation of uh, foundation narratives, national identity construction, and that kind of stuff um, was very interesting to me, and still is. Um, okay, so let me introduce the two panelists that are here, uh, the three panelists that are here. Hi. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so Philip Dalton um, is a professor of rhetoric and public, po can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Philip Dalton is a professor of um, rhetoric and public policy. He's also the director for Hofstra University's Center for Civic Management. Um, and he also, I have to flip you to the other page. <laughs> um, yes, he's also involved in local social media work where he, I initially wrote uh, Infiltrates and then I read it more closely, <laughs> read it closely, uh, where he peruses uh, local right wing social media apps such as Telegram, um, Truth, Gab, etc., which I'm assuming is known to locals. I'm from California, so. We're not doing it. Um, uh, and then he posts about their goings on in local news um, and a Facebook uh, page that he runs called Huntington Voice. Voices. Huntington Voices. Uh, so this is uh, doc, uh, Phil uh, Dr. Dalton. Dalton. Dal Dr. Dalton, thank you. Um, OK, and then Nathan String, Stange. Oh, Stange. I did it. Stang. Stang. Uh, Stange. Three times, three times in two days. Uh, so Nathan Stange, uh, he's a Kansas native. He's a parent. He's a local parent um, and a community activist. He's particularly interested in legal justice reform, cannabis justice, um, and he's organized around various issues with Nassau County, DSA, um, and Bend the Arc Jewish Action. Um, and he was the facilitator for the anti-racism project. Nathan. And then Shoshana? Yes. Shoshana, thank you. Okay. Um, so Sh Shoshana Hershkowitz. Did I pronounce it? Okay, yep. good. So Shoshana Hershkowitz, who's um, Gladys has come. She's a K through 12 and higher ed teacher for more than 25 years, statewide organizer of education and child care um, at City Action, Citizen Action of New York. She's a lecturer as well at Stony Brook University, and she's uh, found, 
founded the organization. Founded. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to share. Uh, she founded the organization Suffolk Progressives following the 2016 election of Donald Trump um, for ordinary citizen engagement. So welcome the panelists that have arrived. I know Eve is on her way. Yes. I was and trying to direct her through the corridors, but I think our friend Jeremy went to find her. And Rachel, who was here last night, so I'm assuming she is coming, but do you want me to just introduce them when they arrive? Yeah. Okay, I'll wait. I'll wait. Um, so that said, and I'll close my own notes. Um, so I've been here in the audience for the last two days, and I think that a common, something that, I've distilled in listening to all of the panels and it was really just so well organized and I it was so well put together and the themes of each of the panels were so consistent um, and what I have distilled from this is that is that there's a common question that I think we're all a little bit frustrated about still um, Marianne I think vocalized it earlier and that is you know to quote Lenin what is to be done um, that question, I think, still remains. I don't know that we're going to come up with an answer here, and, and even if we did, it might be very local. Um, so it's not going to be, you know, a huge answer. But you know, what is to be done? And from from the panels um, and from a, all of the really, really well put together um, papers, the prescriptives that I myself have pulled out or kind of pulled together from the different panels. Um, is a, what is this, one, two, three, four-prong approach to anti-fascism. And I think I would want to start by asking the panelists in this roundtable what is to be done and in, in terms of your perspectives and specifically around the four-pronged approach that I'm constructing in my mind about what is to be done. Um, and that is tackling the issues of labor, race, the environment, and um, female autonomy, women's autonomy, birth, forced birth. So I guess I will start with you, Dr. Dalton. Wow. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I can answer those questions. Uh, I'd say in my own little way, uh, I, I think it's important to reveal what people are doing on the right. And so as you noted, I, I hang out in these right-wing um, social media uh, platforms and find their content. And um, I select the worst of it, uh, screen cap it, and share it. And I, I do that to shed the light of day on it so that people see just what awful stuff is being shared and, and circulated. Uh, but I, as you also mentioned, um, I post this stuff in a page called Huntington Voices, which kind of combines what I call political shitposting with conventional politics. So uh, I'm showing these awful things. And then at the same time, I'll, I'll state that there's an endorsement for a local candidate. Um, if, if, if you're there for more than five, five you know, sweeps of the finger, you realize it's quite clearly um, a left-leaning site. Uh, but it's all written as though, look what I found. This is interesting. Local person posts this comment. Um, one that was most egregious recently was uh, somebody had taken the time to re-edit the Friends opening song to uh, colorized images of leaders of the Third Reich. Uh, and they took the font, and it, it opens with Reich. And then you go through boomerang videos of Hitler and Goring and... Goebbels and, and the rest. Uh, and then with the post, it says, get over your gu white guilt. Admit that it's funny. Uh, and as soon as I posted that, so within about five or six minutes, somebody had screen capped that I had done that and reposted it there that they were being watched. And about 10 minutes later, that had been removed. And they've been a little bit more careful about the, the nature of what they post. But it was really, to, to answer your question, the, the thrust of what I'm doing is just trying to expose what folks in our community, not what some national interest is doing, though I'm sure there's some role there, but there's local folks who are uh, trafficking this stuff. And I, I want to, to show that to folks and, and to, to light a fire under them so that they go out and vote for other people. 
Thank you. Sure. Can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure. Because I think just you know, hearing what you do, something that's coming up in my mind is um, you're really kind of directly sticking your neck out in a way that I think a lot of people, because you're local and you're posting about the local goings on of people that you could come face to face with in a grocery store, it's in, firstly, it's incredibly brave. But secondly, um, it's brave, in my opinion, yes. it's incredibly brave and incredibly necessary um, to kind of shed that light or an out right wing venom, yeah. in, in, you know, extreme right wing venom. Um, but for students um, and for, you know, academics alike, how do you combat the fear that that kind of behavior might arouse with you? Or might, does that make some sense to you? Oh, yeah, it does. I think there's a lot of fear to, to say it or to, to point it out. The only reason I, I rolled my eyes when you said that is because my wife keeps telling me to stop okay. doing this. <laughs> I thought it was and, something I said. <laughs> and I've just had to build up an attitude of, uh, I'm just going to do it. So uh, I suspect this doesn't help uh, keep this under wraps, that I'm the one who runs this. Uh, that I'm up here on this <laughs> dais, uh, though I don't do a whole lot to keep it a secret because it doesn't take a whole lot to figure out there's one administrator to this public group, and yet people still jump in there every now and again and say, who the hell put this up here? And my thought is, well, two clicks away, and there's your answer. Look how I'm hiding it. It's not a fake name. It's even my picture. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, I don't want to bait them by, by making fun of them, though that really is what the page is devoted to. But... Uh, it really doesn't take a whole lot of effort to figure out who I am. Uh, nobody's stepped to me yet, and we'll see what happens. In other words, you feel the risk is worth, is, is worth the action. Let's not get into yeah. what the risks might be, because uh, I don't really want to think on that. Um, I, I, said, I, I know there are people in my community, people on my street who are who are distributing these memes and things like this around. Um, I don't think they think they're doing anything bad, uh, but I disagree with them because I think it normalizes certain things. I, I think a, a large part of the communication that is put out in these, these forums is just intended to aggravate the left. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, I'd written here in preparation for this. You scroll through and you'll find stuff about flat earth, 5G, ge genetic modification, gender in schools, gender in libraries, anti-vax, anti-9-11. Um, and there was a, a post about my, one of my local candidate's genitals. And th this, there's no focus to it. It's just scattershot, constant chaos, uh, attempts to derail um, any kind of thread of conversation about anything and so I'm just trying to what am I going to do I, I see that it's happening I feel obligated to share it thank you sure. thank you for doing it um okay so our other panelist has arrived and let me introduce her hi this hi. is Dr. Evie Eve, 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 Eve Krief yeah. Eve this is Dr. Eve Krief um, I deduced some of your bio, so hopefully that would be okay. Um, she's a pediatrician. She's a pediatrician here in Long Island. Um, and uh, she's also the treasurer of the New York State American Academy of Pediatrics, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and she is part of the Long Island Physicians for National Health Program. Dr. E. I started out, um, the first question, just to catch you up, uh, the first question that I posed is a question that has been kind of, an, been an elephant in the room throughout the last two days, and that is, what is to be done? We've had a lot of panels that have talked about, um, you know, cultural creations um, and expressions of, of anti-fascism, theoretical expressions of anti-fascism, and I think that there's a burning question um, and that you all as activists on the ground um, can hopefully shed some light on, and that is what is to be done, what more needs to be done. Um, do you want me to, can I pass it? Okay, let me. Does this work? Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think it comes down to who controls the truth, and I think that that's what first started alarming me in 2016 when you know, even before um, Trump became president, um, he would say things that were you know, completely untrue, 
Mm-hmm. And, um, and it was just viewed by everybody else, and, and that's obviously become um, the issue right now. It's who controls the truth and the spread of misinformation. And I think, um, you know, there's a few things that, that we can do. Um, it's to make noise and to educate, you know, the public. Um, when there is a problem, when they were separating children at the border, you know, the, a lot of what they do is, you know, dehumanize the other side. They like to, I think, a fascist likes, what I feel is that people, all humans are capable of great good and, and great evil, right? And it's, um, it's leaders that will, will form people's opinions, right? So um, they can either inspire people and make them do good, or they can appeal to their basis nature and inspire them to do um, great evil. Um, the people, you know, during World War II and the Holocaust, right? They, in the, you know, in Germany and the rest of Europe, you know, they were just like you and me, right? They're people. <laughs> we're all we're all humans throughout history, right? We're all the same. We have the same, you know, makeup, and and you know, we'll uh, we are easily influenced, you know, by by um, by people who are good speakers and <laughs> and just appeal to us and make us feel better. Then a lot of what we've seen the past few years is um, just people being made to feel more powerful. Um, because they can feel better than somebody else, better than immigrants, better than LGBTQ people, better than Jewish people, better than black people, better um, you know than, than anything that's different. And, and that's what they appeal to. And then they, they use also just the, the distortion of truth um, to appeal to that, like with the separated children when they separated, clicked in me and I knew that I could not stay silent. So whether that was holding, I can't even tell you how many rallies um, we organized on a variety of issues, the two of us together. Um, and um, just letting people know, always speaking truth, spreading the truth, and um, and obviously that's that's playing into politics. As a pediatrician, you know, we, we see the control of truth, um, you know, morph into control of science and fact as well. And I'm also um, a you know a big um, um, I'm, I'm outspoken on you know vaccine. Um, 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 encouragement, education, um, you know, activism, you could say. But, um, you know, they, they try to control the truth on that as well. And, and that, you know, it harms society, right? We're literally putting our children, our communities at risk because of the spread of misinformation. And, and you see a lot of, of you know, intermixing of, of anti-science um, with, with a lot of this, um, you know, polarization of hate as well um, with, with, you know, doctors now being attacked, say, at Boston Children's Hospital um, because they offer um, care to transgender children who are now on the list of the other and people that are being hated. So it's just this, this great morph of, um, of um, just othering everybody for, to, to raise them to feel better. And it's just about spreading truth, speaking truth, not being intimidated, um, trying to educate the public as much as you can, and obviously getting very engaged in the political system, making people understand um, why their vote is so, so very important. I'm not sure if that answered yeah, your so question. No, I kind of was a, quite of a yeah, flight of ideas there. Sorry. Thank <laughs> you. Um, can I turn it back over to Nathan? Sure. Or still back? Thank you. Um, well, I, I don't think I can uh, answer Lennon's question uh, any better than Maurice Bishop or Thomas Sankara <laughs> have. Um, so I would point to them. Um, but I would say, in terms of what is to be done or, or what is being done, what should be being done, um, you know, if you if you picked up one of these when you walked in. Uh, our conference directors, you know, have sort of outlined uh, fascist ideology and its attendant components as opposition to working class movements, hypernationalism, anti-democracy, white supremacy, and xenophobia. Um, and so I think one thing that we can do and should do uh, is to make anti-fascism great again. Uh, if those are things that you are, are against, then you are in fact an anti-fascist. And I think there are a lot of people out there walking around who, whether it's you know, lack of awareness of, of the term or the history or, you know, the ideology, um, you know, don't necessarily think of themselves as anti-fascists. But when you look at that list and you say, oh, I'm against those things, um, then you are an anti-fascist. And, you know, I think a lot of the ideation of what it means to be anti-fascist or Antifa um, is controlled uh, or colored by, you know, mainstream right-wing media um, and unfortunately, there's not enough pushback from mainstream, uh, I don't know that there is a left-wing media, center-left media, let's say. Uh, there's not enough pushback to saying, you know, that's, that's not the way that you're portraying this doesn't really exist out there in the real world. 
Um, I think one of the uh, you know participants uh, in the conference yesterday was talking about how you know there is some some statistics now where it's you know all of these incidents out there it's it's you know 90 percent of so-called you know anti-fascist north of 90 percent uh, there's no violence at all and you know when there is violence at these events frequently it's you know instigated by fascists or or by law enforcement um, so anyway all of that to say that you know one thing I think we can do is talk to our friends and neighbors um, about I'm an anti-fascist and here's why and here's what that really means uh, and you know bring more people into the fight Thank you. Um, can I just say, I would also like to take back the whole phrase and say anti-fascist, because I think that labeling anti, this I'm just going to say on my own, um, I think that when the right wing media labels us as Antifa, I think that it cuts off the thrust of what it is we're doing and what we're about. And I think that that's a dangerous kind of slope, because you can just shove that aside, oh, that's Antifa, they're so crazy. And I think when you have to actually articulate anti-fascist, that's a much more difficult thing to overtly go against, at least for most people. Okay, so Shoshan. So something that you really <laughs> sparked for me is when you talked about the four prongs, the labor, race, environment, and the fourth birth one birth. was forced birth, right? Yeah, forced birth. And the thing that really struck me was for all of those reasons, Long Island is a breeding ground for fascism. Mm. And you know, when I think about labor and I think about the deep inequity, and it's across so many places in this country, but Long Island, you know, when you go, you can cross a street and live in a different world depending on your zip code. And I think that also when you think about the fact that we are one of the most segregated areas in the country by both socio socioeconomics and race, and when you think about um, the environment. Like I think about, I live in the town of Brookhaven, which has the Brookhaven landfill, which collects the garbage of two million Long Islanders, and it sits in a black and brown community, which, which has the lowest life expectancy on all of Long Island. And then you put all of that together, and you think about the fact that on Long Island, also black maternal health is something um, that, you know, is further, you know, further at risk than, you know, their white counterparts. So when you put all of that together, if you don't have a strong vision and an alternative, fascism will breed. And I think that's why we've seen what we've seen here on Long Island, because quite frankly, um, I don't believe most politicians in the center left have offered an alternative vision that says, this is the world we want to see, this is the alternative to this, and when you don't offer a strong alternative, the room for that demagoguery um, exists and there's a vacuum and it, that hate can flourish in that vacuum. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You present a strong alternative vision, you put your skin in the game, you put your neck out there and it's not fun. Not gonna lie, not fun. I, you know, I think, uh, but, I, but I think it's absolutely 100% necessary. There's no alternative. I think we can all, I think we all, I think yeah. everybody in this room yeah. agrees with that. Um, can I also ask, well, just to follow up on something that you said, because, you know, I live in an area, LA has, I don't know how, I live in Los Angeles, so I'm, it's, it's odd pairing, <laughs> although great, because I am not, I'm very much so not local to Long Island, <laughs> and so I'm not familiar with the local politics and the, and the local groups. Um, but I am familiar with what you're saying about this kind of atomization by zip code. Um, Los Angeles is a huge city and an even bigger county. And there's, there are tribal demarcations based on area codes. We have multiple area codes. So you're either from the 310 or the 818 or the 323 and 562. That's four off the top of my head in front of a bunch of people. So there's a lot and, and it matters. You, you know, suburban, more conservatives, almost edging into Orange County would be 562. Uh, there's a large Jewish community in the 818. You know, 323 is downtown. And the politics are very different. So one, just as a follow-up question to that, how do you bridge that division and find common ground So and, and to present what you're going to do and, and what the agenda is and to present that alternative in a way that would resonate with people 
from so many different walks of life that are all in that same area. I think you have to have a really broad coalition, and I think that you have to le let the people lead in their communities. And I think one of the, the greatest examples of organizing I've seen um, is this community, um, the Brookhaven Landfill Action and Remediation Group, which came out of the George Floyd murders and um, started as a Black Lives Matter group, but then realized that it was connected to this environmental injustice in this area. And I'm a member of that group, but I will never lead that group because it needs to be led by that community. And I think that when we start going into the places that, you know, when we leave our zip code, when we leave our little, you know, silos and enclaves, I think then we have the opportunity to make those connections and meet people. And we each have a role to play. And as long as we know that, you know, when I'm sitting in this, in this landfill meeting, I'm there to support, I'm there to lend a hand, but I am not there to lead because I'm not directly impacted. And I think that starting to understand who is directly impacted in which issue and how you can be a part of the movement and where you lead and where sometimes you're the support is, is really crucial to building that coalition. When it's time to step back, yeah, so to speak. Yeah, absolutely. Or, or to activate sleeper cells. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you want to add to that? Can you add to that? There's no, there's no real sleeper cells, just to be clear. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. Uh, well, I, I've studied the politics of Suffolk County from the inside a little bit, Ugh. and <laughs> what I, I, just to put a finer point on what Shoshana was saying, the, the leadership is heavily top down, and it, the whole say political apparatus seems to function primarily to protect the political uh, fate of those people at the top in the county and in um, the assembly and in the, in the state senate, and so. To affect that, the, the theory seems to be to keep local political parties weak uh, and unpopulated and unstaffed. We have this whole apparatus of hiring people into or electing people into committees, and they're, they're kept usually around half full intentionally so that if someone were to pose a challenge to leadership, they could quickly appoint 50, 60, 70 people who would then show up uh, and vote against you, and then they could just maintain their control. But um, I mean, I was at a local political uh, chair, uh, committee election, and they were handing out scripts for how to execute a, um, how to dispense with the bylaws because they didn't have quorum. And they didn't have quorum because they announced the wrong date for the election and people didn't show up. Was that on purpose? They said Wednesday the 17th of October the election would be held, and that was Monday. Um, so go figure. Anyway. Uh, yeah, so, and these are opportunities too. You could uh, take control if, you, if, they, if folks knew how to organize and take that apparatus back, and it takes leadership, as Shoshana was saying. Um, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, sure which uh, question I'm responding to, but I just, I want, I think. How to bridge the atomization. Yeah, I mean, bridging the atomization, I think, um, you know build sleeper cells would be one way to do it um, is you know <laughs> is meet meet people in the meet people in your local community uh, establish relationships talk to them about these kinds of ideas um, you know in uh, Adolf Reed's keynote yesterday which was great and you know when it hits the internet everybody go watch it but um, I, you know, I hope he was being too pessimistic when he was talking about and I, I'll butcher the quote here but you know something along the lines of uh, you know we're laying the groundwork now that will be found by those fighting for liberation in a future era uh, in the aftermath of coming fascist oppression. Um, I hope that's wrong. Uh, let's do what we can to prevent it. But you know, he really stressed the need for both immediate efforts and long-term planning uh, and the need to build a political organization that is capable of advancing working class interests. So I think that that is one thing that we can do to bridge that gap, right? Because there is a, a mutual class interest across the working class, regardless of zip code, uh, that uh, can unite us. And you know, obviously, the elites that control the mainstream political apparatus, uh, you know, don't, don't want us to find out about that mutual interest uh, and and try to prevent it. Which you know, I think is uh, along the lines of what you're saying. But um, yeah, so you know, uh, find that mutual interest, find um, find community across that class line, the working class line, uh, and you know, fight for fight for each other. 
And specifically when you're talking about combating the kind of hate that I was talking about. So after Charlottesville, I founded this group called Long Island Inclusive Communities Against Hate. And um, we reached out to different different faiths. Um, you know, I reached out. I went. I remember sitting, um, going to like the Catholic church in town, and telling him my mother's story, and asking him to join the group, and just visited with different different you know um, um, faith congregations in, in our area in Huntington. And um, you know, we we partnered with the Latino community when um, you know there was attacks on on immigrants, and um, and we we've, we've just. You know, we've, we've formed a coalition there just because you know we know when they're coming after you know one group they're going to go after another group the next time so um, so it's really important to form partnerships among the, everyone that can be othered and attacked so that when one group is attacked we, we all come out so we had many many rallies supporting the, the immigrant community and when there was a rise in anti-semitism the first rise in anti-semitism <laughs> a couple of years now we're I guess in the midst of the second one but um, a few years back after the, the Tree of Life synagogue and there were other attacks across um, New York State, um, they came out in support of, of um, you know, the Jewish community. So it's important to stand together. Also, just every town in um, Suffolk is supposed to have an anti-bias task force um, that ideally should have on it um, um, officials, um, elected officials, educators, um, and invested community members. And um, <laughs> They all a report from the the police precinct on on um, hate incidents and crimes, and um, and we have a very functional one um, in Huntington right now. Um, I think there's one in Islip as well, um, but that's that's an important way also just to bring everybody together to stand against hate. Um, you know, unfortunately, not all you know political parties um, will come to those meetings, but um, um, it's it's supposed to represent a bipartisan just um, you know group against hate and to keep track of it in our communities Thank you. Um, let me continue on with another question that's within the same um, frame and that is something I think Nathan that you mentioned um, which is you know there's long-term goals and there's short-term goals I'll ask you on a local level because we're supposed to be talking about local activism. Um, if you can pull it out to a larger, then I'm all ears. Um, but what do you, what, what, I'll go across, but what do you see as the short versus long term goals? Or what, what are, at least here, if not globally? <laughs> I mean, I think the, the long-term goal, there was talk a lot yesterday about, you know, sort of force and counterforce of fascism and anti-fascism. Um, I think the long-term goal is to, you know, to build that counterforce that it can stand against the tide of those, you know, those elements of, you know, again, opposition to working class movements, hyper-nationalism, anti-democracy, white supremacy, and xenophobia. You know, all of which you see playing out uh, certainly at the, the national level and, you know, in, in you know, different aspects on, on the local level as well. Um, so, you know, in the long term, you know, build that build that force, counterforce. Um, and I think like <laughs> Dr. Dalton and I were talking earlier about, you know, uh, looking for the stuff and, and attacking it online on social media. Um, which I, I certainly think there's a place for, and, and you know, his work sounds great, and uh, you should all be doing it in your local communities as well. Uh, but, but, you know, I think taking it offline as well is important, and, uh, you know, being, a, so, so as a short-term goal, I would say, is to, you know, form a neighborhood watch watch, uh, be on the lookout for fascists in your community, uh, and for, you know, their messaging and the manifestations of their, their ideology, um, I live in Rockville Center, where mm. the Southern Poverty Law Center says the Proud Boys have uh, a chapter based there, um, and they have marched there, uh, you know, twice through town. We've had flyers uh, distributed by the Goyim Defense League. Um, so, you know, anti-Semitism is having a moment uh, in the national news right now, uh, but, you know, it's, uh, it's part of all of this, and so... Uh, I would look for those local manifestations, fight them, push back, ask questions, uh, you know, of local politicians, local law enforcement, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, the Human Rights or Civil Rights Commission, we have one locally, um, and it has never met. And the mayor said that's because we don't have any civil rights issues, which um, <laughs> was interesting to learn. Um, so anyway, I'll stop there. But. 
um, my goal is, uh, well, my thinking is that uh, why work to start a whole new apparatus to push back when there's one already there? So I'm outing myself as a Democrat. Uh, except for that, in my years-long push to, to get the, the party to be somewhat responsive to its membership or aspiring members, uh, they've done nothing but, but push back and push back and, and push back. So uh, you can try to do it from the inside, which I, I've learned uh, they, do, they don't want that. They, they see you coming a mile away and the obstacles are put up before you showed up. Uh, or you could try to find a way to wrangle the, the power away from them, um, which may have to be the, the next move of mine. But that gets me down a whole other path besides uh, what I d I've done with my, my little Facebook page. It's not that awesome. That's, that's pretty big. So, Dr. Kriya? Um, short and long-term goals? Yeah, short, short and long-term goals as you see it. As a pediatrician, as an activist? Um, short-term goals, just... Um, you know, get the facts out there and, and increase empathy, um, you know, share stories, um, long-term goal, um, save our democracy. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'd say short-term goals is spotting those moments in your own communities. Please try again. A lot of things have gone wrong. <laughs> it's okay. Tell me about uh -huh. it, Siri. Siri, how do we defeat fascism? <laughs> She might, have a she might have the answer. Um, we just haven't asked. Um, but I think, you know, we've seen it on Long Island quite a bit. Like, for example, in a library board where they were trying to ban books, to, uh, like the pride Ooh. display in the children's section, and then um, trying to infiltrate that library board during the elections. And there was a, like, it turned into a full fledged fight for a library board. And this, our school board seemed to look the same way. And, and even the school board member, she, she can spill the tea. But, um, you know, I think that we have to recognize that it's not just a D.C. thing or an Albany thing. It's a your block. It's a your school's thing. And I think as a teacher, for me, it is making sure that my classroom is a safe space. It is a welcoming space. And it is a space where we speak the truth and where we talk about all of these issues and we don't shy away from it. And you know what? If, you know, some kid from Turning Point USA is filming me secretly and sticking it up online, so be it. You know, like, I, like we just have to be ready to do this work in the short term because the vacuum is what is most dangerous. And I think that the long-term goal is empowering people and giving them the skills to do the work with us because I think that right now the work is often in a very small concentration of hands, not because people don't care, but because, one, people are afraid, two, people don't know what the first step is, and I think so much of what we have to do is that education piece to give people the motivation and also the steps forward. And I, that, that, that's my teacher brain thinking about how do we train the next generation. Yeah, I, I like that. Did you want to know? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I think some of what you were saying um, about this, there being kind of a vacuum, to some degree, I think what you're bringing up, Dr. Dalton, about the, please correct me if I'm, mis, if I'm misquoting you or paraphrasing you, um, but that there's a pushback in the, in the hierarchy of the Democratic Party uh -huh. that is thwarting the ability to make changes in a grassroots level on the ground in school boards and running candidates that may not fit the, the bill of this kind of top-down leadership. How, what would be the prescriptive for that? Because I, th I think that what you're, I think what you articulated is something that at least I sense also on a national level. When you look at the Sanders campaign in 2016 and the bending over backwards to stop his ability to continue. Um, so I think I mean, that's the lowest hanging fruit, an example of that, and universally know, you know, understood. But how do you combat that? I mean, you're working from within, so you're in this, you have a good vantage. You do what he does, which is organize. Uh, and I don't have the bandwidth to do that. So I go home and take my kid to soccer or uh, take care of my college kid on the phone or run out to see him or I go to work and I do all, and I'm a den leader for scouts and all this other stuff that I do. Um, but, but really what, what he does, and I tell, this, I tell this to people in politics all the time, 
Um, it's, you've got to do the shoe leather retail work. And if you're not doing that, you're scratching at the surface, uh, maybe, and you may be causing yourself to think you're actually doing work and when, when you're not. So and I'm kind of reticent to take uh, praise for the kind of work that I've done because uh, it may do, do a little bit, but I'm not going to make believe that it's doing the real, the real um, groundwork that, that needs to be done. So Nathan? I'm also raising children, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, and it is difficult, right, to walk and chew gum at the same time. But uh, we really have to on these issues. Um, and um, yeah, uh, no, look, um, I, I think, again, and I just, I know I keep repeating myself here, but uh, you know, one thing that we have to do is like go out and talk to folks who we don't necessarily, there's gonna be some people we're not gonna be able to convince, right? But uh, is to talk to people that we don't necessarily know you know, are, are, are you know in full agreement with us on, on various issues, but uh, you know, talk to them about these things. And you know, part of the part of a, a group of parents that I've tried to help organize in my local town, and again, this is like the kind of thing I would say everybody should be trying to do, um, is you know, put together this group of parents that you know care about maybe different issues to different degrees, uh, but that again are, are intersectional around these you know these ideas that we're talking about. Um, and to then, you know, organize, educate amongst those, you know, that group of folks, talk about these issues, and then, uh, you know, organize and weaponize, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I want to call her out by name, but uh, one of those parents from the group of folks that uh, I'm part of is, is in the audience tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, you need people with different skill sets and different abilities uh, to be part of that group, and she's someone who you know, somebody else from the group said, hey, the Proud Boys are marching through town. She jumped in her car, drove, drove to where they were marching, confronted them face to face, took video of them, called them out, told them to get, get out of our town. Um, you know, a little harsher words than that. But, uh, but, you know, not everybody who you're gonna talk to has that bravery. And so you need people who are brave, who are there on the front line. You need people who are gonna show up for a rally of 30 people. Uh, or you know, hundred people or whatever it is to you know to speak out against hate, to speak out against fascism. Um, you need people who are willing to write a letter to you know the mayor or make a phone call. Uh, so you know, organize, agitate, get people together, get people you know talking about these issues. Uh, super important. Thank you. Um, I will say that just from my from my I teach history. So um, I will historicize that. And I will say that a lot of what you're saying is resonating with me because this is what the Nazis did. Um, after, after the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923 and Hitler went to jail and wrote Mein Kampf, which nobody read, thankfully. I mean, or maybe they should have. Um, they, the Nazi apparatus decided consciously to go very, very grassroots. The big shows, big, huge moments weren't going to work, and they very consciously went very, very grassroots. And I think somebody at a panel yesterday was talking about, um, you know, go where they go. You, you know, you don't want to follow completely, but that there is, there's a logic to that, and I think that's kind of what you're echoing here, mm -hmm. is that, you know, organize as locally as you possibly can to tentacle away, or to, to get the tentacles out of you know, the Proud Boys out of Long Island. Um, okay, so I have another um, question here, which is, so I had articulated, where am I? I had brought up, yeah, here I am. So I brought up those four prongs of, of what I, in my mind, distilled from all the, the really diverse panels that have been presented over the last two days. Um, and again, I put down labor, race, environment, forced birth, culture wars. I think I forgot to, to bring that up. What do you see in Long Island, or what do you see as, as the first prong? What do you see out of those, out of those criteria? But there's so many prongs. Yeah. <laughs> now, honestly, I mean, I feel like it's the, 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 a, yeah. the, there's no one answer. Mm -hmm. I think that the culture wars have certainly come and we're watching them play out in so many ways. You see them in our school board meetings, you see them in doctor's offices, you, you know, um, 
But to me, again, I come from an education-centered perspective. I think that <clears throat> when they lost in 2020, and there was this initial burst of success in 2021 with the vaccine and um, the American Rescue Plan, it was no accident they, they went super local, like you said, and went to our schools and started mm. with like the critical race theory stuff and like really went down to where the most basic emotional impetus, which is our children. Like that is 100% that is by design. And they're coming for our schools because if that next generation knows truth, then the world changes for the better. Not, not the better for, for fascists, yeah. but, um, but I think that that's why they're, you know, it, like if you follow these school board meetings, which I have across Long Island, it's part of my work and across the state, it is the same script in every mm -hmm. place. So if it's like, if you hear it in Comac on Tuesday, it happens in Smithtown on Wednesday and then over in my community in Three Village on Thursday, and it's like playing whack-a-mole. It's like, you, you know, it's like, we're gonna ban this book. Then you go through that round. Then it's like, we're gonna go after this website. And it just keeps circling. And now it's transgender kids and pronouns. And it's like, it's one after the other. And I really think that we have to, within our schools, send a message that there is no place for it. And that these kids deserve to have a space where they are safe, where they are welcome, where they are nurtured. And that that stuff doesn't come in those doors. And I think that if we can do that, that is a major first step to defeating fascism and to preventing it in the next generation. Oh, there was a hand there. Oh, I'm so. Should we? I was just going to Come to the microphone because it's being recorded. Don't go to the microphone because it's being recorded. <laughs> and, and I'm an educator as well. That I think that public education, which has been under attack for at least 20 years, as we all are pretty much aware of, I think we've got to be more willing to admit that public education is a political project, and and as a result. We want to create better informed citizens who can participate in our still remaining democracy. And I think there's a lot of people in education that are reluctant to do that. And we had an issue in Rockville Center where a social studies teacher was basically trying to an analyze um, various ideas out there and try to help the kids understand them from a critical perspective. And she, and she put a piece up from Ibram Kendi. It created a firestorm. And there weren't enough people standing up and saying, hey, no, 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 no. Education really is about trying to create people who are able to critically appraise any form of information or idea. And, and I don't think we, we do that enough in public education. I've been in public education for 35 years. And so you know, we, we try to create this notion that it's a, it's a safe space. And I agree with you. It should be a safe space where kids should be able to grow and become who all they're capable of becoming, if you want to use that phrase. But it's just annoying that uh, you know, see somebody like Glenn Youngkin basically trying to say, parents, you have a choice. You can pull your kids out. I'm a lifelong health educator in sex education, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. And so <laughs> uh, I know all about these fights. And, and, you know, when you look at surveys, by and large, 85% of people think, you know, yeah, I don't want to deal with telling my kids about sexuality. Y you do it. Uh, but, you know, the devil's in the details. So I just wanted to comment that I agree with you that schools have to be, but I think we have to acknowledge schools as a political project that, that follow in you know, Dewey's notion of schools as communities coming together and helping people to think together as a community to solve problems and, and, and you know, not necessarily, um, uh, you know, it, it is important. That's, that's, where, that's where the battle lies, that, that you, know, you talked about anti-critical race theory, the transgender and all that stuff. I mean, those are all sort of smoke screens that are, that are uh, promoting fascism, if you will. Yeah. I, I, I want to respond, though, because so, so much of what you said, and I come from public ed, and I, I know the way the schools work, I think that teachers aren't being empowered enough and that their administrations don't have their backs often enough when they ha make those big, bold moves. And r reading candy shouldn't be big and bold because it's good writing, you know? But, but I also think that we have to dis dispel the notion that learning is comfortable. Because it's not, it's not supposed to be. Like when you work out a muscle, you're gonna be sore the next day. When you work your brain, it should hurt a little. It shouldn't all just be easily digestible. And I think that like that, that is going to require our profession. And not, not, I wouldn't say not just the rank and file, but the people at the top in leadership. It always comes back to bad leadership, doesn't it? Um, who are willing to push back and say like, 
You gotta learn what you gotta learn because that's the world. Um, yeah, I just wanna say too, I mean, as far as like, you know, taking these fights to the school board, uh, I mean, the, the culture warriors on the other side have said that's what they're doing, right? And one of the presentations yesterday, uh, they quoted Steve Bannon, who said, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna win the future in the school boards. I'm, like, I'm sure I'm butchering that quote again, but, um, you know, and I, I think too, like it's important to keep in mind that, uh, yes, of course, fight this at a local level, but, but also to keep in mind that these are local manifestations of an international issue uh, and that you see, um, you know, this rise and, and electoral political success globally, uh, whether it's in Italy with Maloney or Viktor Orban in Hungary, um, you know, that's happening. And, uh, you know, doc Dr. Gerald Horn uh, has talked about how, uh, you know, historically fascism arises in order to repress uh, a surging left and left-led political parties. Uh, and I certainly don't think we're there yet on Long Island or in the United States. Um, but, you know, he also talks about how it would be a mistake to assume that there, you know, was no mass base for fascism in Germany and that there's no mass base for fascism here in the United States. Um, so that's something else that I think we very much need to keep in mind is that if, if a counterforce is not presented, if uh, a different ideology is not presented, people are looking for answers to the world that they see around them that <laughs> does not offer a lot of answers. Uh, and so they're going to latch on to something and that, you know, fascism is, is there, you know, offering, offering an answer. So we have to offer a counter answer. Dr. Dalton? Yeah, my response to the idea uh, that we have all these prongs, these different fronts to, to fight on, it reminds me of uh, Hillary Clinton running for president. And when she lost, I had students gnashing teeth. And I, I said, well, what, what was she for? And they'd, they'd give me that smile, like, oh, you got me. Because um, they couldn't say. They couldn't articulate it clearly. Uh, they just knew they were with her but they, and were disappointed that she lost and, and more disappointed that Trump had won. Um, my, my, my thinking there is pick something to, to be for. This is my, my pro tips for Democrats, uh, is pick something you're going to advocate for and solidify a coalition around it so that when you have these smaller issues that come up locally, the coalition's there. They've already fought for something. They've already identified with one another. They have the phone numbers and the phone tree and everything else. It's already put together. But um, that doesn't seem to be what is the guiding uh, knowledge of, of the uh, political elites, on the left, anyway. You have a question? Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll keep both of them very short. I was sitting over here, so I was sitting behind a dozen students. I keep watching. And, and I, I, oh, your microphone. You, you're too tall or it's too short. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. That's the star of my life. <laughs> uh, so I was sitting over here, sitting behind these students, and I was thinking, you know, Forgive me if I draw you into this conversation <laughs> like this. You haven't asked me. But I'm thinking, what if one of them came up to me afterwards and said, what should I do? You know, what should I do to gain control over my life or to shape my future in a way that, that I, I, I feel comfortable with? Now, one part of the answer, I, I, I would know what to tell them. And that is, if you get a job, if there's a union, join the union. If, if there isn't a union, form the union. Make sure it's a democratic union. Make sure it's a union controlled by the rank and file. Make sure you have a say in your life, in, in, in your place of work. So that's an easy one. But if they do want to get involved in kind of a little more mega politics, the ones that you're, uh, Phil, are involved in, what should we tell them? Should, should they fight to reform or to take back the Democratic Party to make it something that it's not? Should we tell them to go and hope to create a third alternative? What? What am I going to tell one of them when, when they, when, you know, after this talk they come up and say, okay, I want to get involved. What should we do? I, I have one suggestion, and it is if you can get 10 friends together who show up and walk, well, and walk when uh, politicians need people to walk, politicians will show up in your backyard to talk with you. 
and they'll talk with your friends. Because what at the end of the day, the day, they need those retail people out in the streets, licking envelopes, sending out cards, and and going to, to doors. And if you can marshal 10 of them, you're, you're a player. And it, it sounds like it actually is more work than it sounds like when I just say it's only 10. But nevertheless, if you can pull that off, you'll be on somebody's in somebody's black book they'll be calling you and wanting to get to know you better Ethan uh, yeah I there's strength in numbers right so talk to your friends find out where you have common interests common beliefs uh, join join an organization join join a party uh, you know if you think that uh, attempting to reform the Democratic Party is the answer I, I don't know that it is uh, but if you think that if you get those 10 friends and you go to your local Democratic you know, club committee meeting and you say, hey, you know, we're the people, this is what we actually think, you know, strength in numbers. So I, I don't know the answer, but uh, strength in numbers. Dr. Kier? I, mean, I, would, I would just say, you know, it's, it's a very pivotal moment right now. And um, I thought you were gonna say, get 10 friends and vote, because I, I think you need, to, you need to really get 20 friends and vote. Um, you know, I'm a full-time pediatrician. I work every day, and um, last night I had people over, and we phone banked for, for candidates across Long Island, and this morning I, um, I walked um, across doors and door knocked and handed out information about early voting um, for the morning. And, um, and this weekend, the whole weekend, I'm going to be knocking on doors and canvassing for candidates. And, um, you know, we know that some elections are close. I know that the senator that won the Democratic line in the New York State senator the last election only won by seven votes, right? So when they say every vote matters, every vote really does matter. And this election could not be more important. There's so many issues at stake. Um, all of them, um, you know, represent a form of fascism <laughs> if, if they succeed, um, all the ones we've talked about tonight. And um, it's such a critical election for um, you guys to get out and vote and get everybody you know to go out and vote because all of our futures depend on it, most of all yours. Yes to all of that. <laughs> um, th I really do agree with the union piece coming from the labor movement. I've been a union officer. I'm actually a member in where I'm an adjunct and in my full-time work, a member of both unions, and um, the solidarity that the labor movement can build is really important and can shape your life in a really good way. Um, as far as voting, I, I will say this in a really cynical, cynical way. I don't, I, most of the time, I don't necessarily, you know, love the person I vote for. Every once in a while, there's some unicorn on my belt that I'm like, you know, this is great. <laughs> I vote nonetheless, and I do volunteer and do the canvassing and the phone banking and all of that, but the reason you should vote is because politicians really only care about their next election. So your vote is your currency. So like, if you want them to care about the things you care about, young people have to show up with the same power that people over 65 do, because you know, if God forbid like this election doesn't go the way it's supposed to and they go to chop Medicare, You'll have people railing because they know 65 and up votes. But will they fight as hard for, you know, tuition-free public college? Probably not because 18-year-olds don't vote at the same rate. So I think if you want, if you want environmental justice, if you want racial justice, if you want tuition-free public college, which I think is a really great idea, um, you have to outvote senior citizens. Like, simply because that is the currency of politicians. Hello, uh, thank you for all being here. Uh, you started to actually talk about my question, and maybe as a parent and as a teacher, what exactly has been the response of the teachers' union that you're familiar with in terms of these broader issues that we're talking about? Um, as far, now I am like through the collegiate part of the union involved, but I mean, I think as far as um, Teachers feel attacked, and I personally, I mean, I, I will just off the cuff say, I don't think the response from the teachers' union has been as strong as it should be. I think that often it's reactive as opposed to proactive. I think they stepped up this year because they saw the threat that was coming in these school board elections, and because they stepped up the unions, they largely beat it back. But I do think that, again, in the absence of a powerful alternative the craziness of those school board meetings where we're talking about banning books, where we're talking about, you know, vaccines are, are you know, similar to like what Goebbels did, you know, like, uh, you know, like, 
if there isn't a strong, fierce pushback from unions um, collectively, we will continue to fight this fight and not win it. And I do think, I'm, I'm just going to speak a whole lot of truth that probably will you know, not be popular, but I think because of the, I think this is where politics is important, because of the Janus decision and the fact that you can opt out of the union, still get a lot of the benefits and all of that. Teachers, I, and unions, and not just teacher unions, but unions are afraid to be super bold because they don't want to lose their dues. So, you know, when we think about how it all impacts things, you know, that local teachers union, at, we have 125 school districts on Long Island, that little local in this town, the way they approach something is going to be shaped by that Janus decision. And that's something to really keep in mind how the national stuff really does impact the local landscape. Uh, just if you could follow up with, when you say <clears throat> the union pushed back, exactly how did they push back? Well, I think that they started organizing for their endorsed candidates. Like, for example, in my particular, te the union in my home district, um, they were running some, the Long Island Loud majority was running some candidates. So NYSIT really did push back um, and took the, like, the Teachers Association endorsed candidates, phone banked for them. There was, you know, some signs put out for them. And again, this is like a small, relatively small election, but they were more engaged than they may have been in the past because the threat of that far-right attack on our schools and trying to get those folks on our school boards. But I think that the fight should have started the year earlier when this was all being seated, if not before. I just, if you don't mind, I would just like to take a minute just to introduce our, our, our fifth panelist. Uh, this is Rachel Hu, and she's a journalist and editor of Breakthrough News and a national organizer. Uh, with the Party for Socialism and Liberation in Long Island. Uh, she's the host um, of the Covert Action Bulletin podcast at 99.5 NYC. So this is Rachel. Thanks for having me. I am so apologize about the timing of my arrival. It has been a day, so to speak. I, I work in New York City, and the trains were not agreeing with me here. But I'm so appreciative to be invited to this panel. I think, you know, with the very little time we do have, I think one of the things I do want to share with everybody who's here, who's probably been part of a wonderful conversation about what it means to fight back in these times, I think it's really important that we talk about building movements on the ground, that we talk about how we can build people's power, because the only way to fight back against the right wing is to build a movement of people's power that has a real ideology, that's based in something. I think all of us feel in the pit of our hearts where we are that we want something more. There's a hunger inside of us. And what that hunger is, is a hunger for power. And not individual power, but it's a hunger for collective power. What's missing, what's missing in our fights today is that we have movements that are atomized, individualized. We have the movement against the right wing kind of over here. We have a movement for black lives over here. We have a movement for women's rights over here. But the reality is all of those fights are the same fight because we're fighting the exact same enemy. And so what it means and what I want to encourage folks here to think about and to bring with them in, in this conversation is that we have to fight for something more. We shouldn't be told to accept the scraps and allow the scraps off the table of what they say they, that we should have. That's why the right is winning. It's why the right has been growing and why it's been allowed to grow. It's been allowed to grow because we have a system that does not care about the people's needs. It has prioritized time and time again corporate profits. And what we need to fight for as activists, as individuals, what we need to be a part of and the movements we need to be a part of are ones that fight fundamentally for something. And so I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation, and I'm a socialist. And that word scares a lot of people. But the socialists have always been at the forefront of the fight against the right. And the socialists have always been fighting for something more. And what that is, is the right to a job, the right to a home, the right to health care, the right to marry who we love, the right to be who we are, the right to be free of racism, and the right of self-determination for poor, working, and oppressed peoples. And we have to fight for what we believe in, our fundamental rights. We have to fight for the world we want, 
not just the world that we're told that we can have, because the right will always win under those circumstances, because they have a platform. They have an ideology, and it's a very basic ideology. It's to hate, and it's a very basic ideology to blame. The problems of capitalism are the faults of these people, these individuals, these immigrants over here, black people over here, trans people over here. That's their ideology. So what's your ideology? What are you fighting for? What are we fighting for as a movement? It has to be for something more. It has to be for a new system, a system for and by working class people. And for me, that is a system of socialism. So thank you guys for inviting me. I apologize for coming in so late, but I wanted to at least say something. <laughs> better, late, better late than never. That was like some truth. <laughs> yeah, you, you brought it. You just came and brought it. <laughs> yes. You're right. <laughs> Phil, I just wanted to tell you that I was there at that meeting where the Democrats were uh, thinking about who to vote for and how to vote, so on and so forth. I'm a committee person. But anyway, um, I think that part of the problem is getting the messaging out the way people perceive things, just like the um, message that we want to defund the police. Now, we don't want to defund the police. Well, we want. <laughs> let, let her finish, let her finish. We want to reappropriate the funds so the police can have the right tools to use when they go like for a domestic violence visit. This past spring, from March to June, for 16 weeks, one night a week, three hours, one night a week on a Wednesday night, I joined the Civilian Academy. Is anybody familiar with what the Civilian Academy is? It's three hours that I spent with policemen. They had all different uh, uh, police officers doing different subjects like, um, like uh, 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 crime and uh, rape and all different social issues. They took us to the, the firing range so we can fire a firearm. They, they let us drive police cars. They did uh, stop in, um, uh, you know, like a, a, the, um, almost, uh, they, they um, we, we saw the canines. They took us out where the canines were. Um, it, was very, it was probably the best course that I've ever taken. And anybody that wants to to, uh, and, and there's all different people. There's, there's all different races. There's Democrats and Republicans and you know, all, and you could ask questions. And the police officers were, were very dynamic in what they had to say. And they had all different, different aspects of the police department. And I thought it was just a fabulous, uh, you know, they, they tell you how to do community service and, it's just fabulous, and I think that everybody should should go online and look up Civilian Academy, and uh, it's only one 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 night a week for three three hours, and it's for 16 weeks, and at the end you have a little party, and you get to meet a lot of the police officers, and it's very. Uh, so this is this is Civilian Action. Civilian Academy. Civilian Academy, and they did have you have a question too? Is no, 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 I was just wondering. Okay. To, is it okay so, to respond real quick? Yes, please. I think, um, I mean, I, to me, having worked on, it was Governor Cuomo's Executive Order 203 in black-led groups that were dealing with police reform, for me, if I ever talk to a police officer, the things I want to know yeah, is why black drivers were pulled over at four to five times the rates yeah. of white drivers in Suffolk County. I want to know why Latinos are pulled over at twice the rate. And I, and I think that... If we want to really build a real relationship between law enforcement and the community, there has to be accountability. And right now in Nassau and Suffolk County, there is no accountability for law enforcement. So for me, while I think that this was pro this probably felt really good, but I do think that like we need to have deeper conversations. But you can. Let me. You can. But I think that they have to come to our table, not us to theirs, and they have to listen to the people who they have directly impacted, which are predominantly black and brown people in Nassau and Suffolk County. And I think that we, particularly, particularly as white people, we have to understand that when we interact with the police, we are treated differently. 
end, and I, I think that I, we have to be very honest about I, that. I, I, let I me agree let with me you. just uh, just in the F, in the interest of time, and there's two students behind you, and oh, remember sorry. they get dibs. So let me let me thank give you. them let me give them the floor so that they okay. can ask. Okay. But thank you. Please come. Hi. Um, okay. Uh, so I'm from a very not I wouldn't say very, but I'm from a small town in Delaware. Um, so I. I was I was coming to ask because I um, my mother is running for school board of the for my local school board the high school that I went to, unfortunately she stands against a lot of things that we are here talking about. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. So my question is kind of regarding it is very hard to confront her on those things because it's my mom and I love her and she raised me, and um, a lot of the things that she stands for would go um, against some of the things that I identify with and prioritize. Uh, she is for banning certain books. She would uh, be against uh, gender neutral bathrooms, uh, things like that, that would affect, um, not only I have younger siblings in the school, um, but um, you know, future generations possibly. Um, she's still running, she has not been elected yet, um, but I know that she's very highly favored. Um, so my question was kind of regarding how do you approach those uncomfortable situations where, um, and she's not a fascist, but obviously like, um, but like, how do you approach those situations where they're not strangers, they're not your neighbors, these are people you know and the people you love. Um, it's, it's a hard situation to approach, so it's kind of my question. Have you had conversations with her about what your concerns are? Like, have you sat down and had heart-to-hearts with her about why these issues concern you and you disagree with her? Um, yeah, and it kind of came to a point where it was damaging our relationship, and so for... Um, keeping our relationship stable, it was kind of like I had to let that go, which was hard, very hard, because it was like, do I lose my mom or, you know, confront these uh, very harmful ideals. So um, now that I, I'm a freshman, um, so uh, we, I just moved up here, uh, so this is the first time I've been away from her, um, so it's kind of like I wanted to at least leave with a good relationship, and it feels icky to be complacent with these things. So yeah, very, very hard question. <laughs> I mean, I'll say this. I think we should definitely talk afterwards. I've been through a very similar situation just as a person. But I think the, the big thing here is to ask yourself too on a level of how much does what your mother believe actually impact you? Because a lot of it is. And do you deserve that? And do you deserve to put yourself through a relationship with somebody who doesn't value your worth and value what you bring to the table? It's a very personal one-on-one -on -one conversation, but I think a broad question, a broad answer to the question of how we talk to people is that we, people can change. We can win people over to new ideas, but we have to be willing to, one, know exactly what we're talking about. We have to be very informed, but we also have to be willing to have those conversations, and they're hard, and we have to be willing to decide when to walk away because you actually can't win everybody. How can I take that energy of the anger I have towards this person and put it towards winning other people? winning people that actually will come to our side and building something bigger. So that's my thought, but I'd, I'd love to chat more. I I'd like, I think you'll do it. Right, I'd like to, to add to that, though. Don't walk away from the relationship. Walk away from the argument, yeah. uh, or I'd have no family. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm from the Midwest. I can guarantee my mom's watching Fox News right now, and my brother and sister are sitting there with her. And uh, next time I'm back, I'm the butt of all jokes because I'm the Northeastern liberal at a university who reads books and all that stuff. Uh, so what do I do when I go in there? I violate expectations and I listen to them. And every now and again, I can you know, get them to break on something. But uh, I, I think a lot of the arguments that maybe, I don't know your mother's arguments, but uh, a lot of the arguments you, you see on the, the right are absurd. and. I don't know that people genuinely give them thought to back them. They don't reason, well, God, that was, that's a slam dunk argument. I, I, I agree with that. Uh, I think it's more, if this antagonizes the, the left, then I'm all behind it. It must be getting under their skin, so I, I'm for this person. Uh, and in, those, in that context, you can't win an argument, so why bother having it? And that's why I agree with walking from the can, argument. Can I say one more thing? We also, we have one yeah, we, two yeah. more no. students. I, 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 I am happy to stick around, but I, I want to say to you, your mom cares what you think. You matter, and I think that you can tell her you're disappointed. You can say, I don't agree with you on this, and I think this is harmful, and this hurts me. Now, that may not change her mind, but it will make her think. And 
that allows you to stick to your ideals. And you may not change her mind, but you can speak your truth to her. And it may make her think twice. Because you're, you're, you are an adult, and, but she still values you. You're like, as a mom, she's, you are still her baby. So, Thank you. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Don't be afraid to manipulate your mom's emotions, <laughs> is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, you have a question. Thanks for waiting. Hi. Um, so earlier you were talking about spreading awareness and um, how to counter some of the issues that were brought up on the right, and I completely agree with you. Um, but there are some people in social media, young and old alike, um, that said that people from the left just got too, too, too intrusive by saying that lefties like to impose their belief onto them. Uh, for example, I saw, one, saw this one video of um, a person saying that they, as black individuals, just do not feel oppressed. They don't feel that they don't feel that the issue um, is present, and instead they say that oh, all lives matter. It doesn't matter who you are, as you know, what kind of ethnic you are. Racism just doesn't really exist anymore in this day and age. And they say that people from the left are, are just are just too forceful. Okay, saying that oh, no, you are uh, uh, no, you are oppressed, and you should feel that way and join our cause. And they just feel a little offended in a way to say that. You know, uh, like, like you, you know what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> um, so, like, there are a lot of people who just simply do not agree with you in all in, in in all aspects. How do we reach them? I'm not planning to. <laughs> They're not my audience. Yeah, no, I definitely think that yeah. at the end of the day, you have to think about this fight, right? There are millions of people in this country we have to win. Millions of people who are not sure about where they stand politically. People who are aghast at some of the atrocities that happen in this country and want to do something about it. So to me, as an organizer, just this is how I operate. Sometimes you gotta let them go. That's not the person I'm fighting with. That's not the person I'm trying to win over because there are liter there's literally always another door to knock on, always another person to speak to that you can win over. If they're your friends, I think it's a different kind of leverage, similar to the question before, there's a different kind of conversation, but otherwise, we need to be building a movement that has not only millions of people involved to win, but we need people who are ideologically understand what they're fighting for. And that's a much bigger goal than we can achieve with somebody who really won't even move an inch on something that is completely false. Swipe, swipe the other way and keep going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you for waiting. Not an issue. Thank you for coming. And uh, hi, Phil Dalton. I actually uh, <laughs> interviewed you and Dr. Traciati at our Day of Dialogue, so it's good to see you. Um, I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about how I observed this as a student, because I mean, this is the this is the group that you're trying to reach. Um, in my opinion, tonight, I mean, I really do appreciate you guys coming out. I think it was a bit of very. I, I would agree that in this sense. There is a lot of people on the right wing that don't agree. But I also think that at the same time, the delivery of this meeting was kind of, a, not to be disrespectful, but a pat on the back to each other. And I sometimes don't think that's the proper way to reach out to people. I mean, I have saw people walk out, and I just had to make sure that they were all right before they left. Um, and like you said, you know, and, and that's your opinion, is if you, that's certain people you don't want to reach, that's totally okay. But as you know, you guys proclaimed, and um, guys is in the sense of all of you, um, you know, this is obviously a sensitive topic because in college and universities, I would be uh, very far thrown to say that um, most people are very open to ideas. Um, and when I say most people, I'm referring to the people that are teaching me. Um, they generally encourage you to go this direction. It's been all about the positives of the Democratic Party. Um, how can you expect people to want to join your cause if this is how you control yourself, or not, not control yourself, but advertise yourself to the public and claim that you're accepting, but at the same time dismissing people who are giving different outlooks, such as you know, interaction with the police force or other opportunities in that nature? I know it's a long question, but I would really appreciate yeah, just something. Who, I'm saying, who would you like to answer? Who would you like to answer first? Any of you would that would be more than I would be more than Dr. welcome Dalton? to hear anything from you guys. It would be sure. greatly appreciated. <laughs> and That's the toughest spot. nut to I'm crack tonight. To uh, I 
I was in a, a Huntington Housing Coalition meeting yesterday on Zoom, and there was this talk about, you know, what are, what are the root problems? How do we get more affordable housing? And then it came down to racism. And the, there isn't housing because there's racism. They won't change the zoning because they're racists. And, and I'm not gonna claim that's not true because I know enough to know that race played a huge role in the zoning to begin with and so I agree. on. But the, the point I'm trying to get at is, as we sat in that room, I grew increasingly uncomfortable because I'm thinking at some point, you've gotta reach out beyond this group of 14 people who are in this Zoom call. And if your opening gambit is to say, uh, abandon your racism, you've, you're, you're done. Same thought, think, uh, thought I have is uh, regarding um, abortion. Uh, you can't have discussions about reproductive rights. I seldom have, hear these conversations held where people who are pro-life are talked about as though they could potentially be kind people. And my mother's one who's very pro-life. Uh, or uh, what the language was used earlier, uh, forced birth. Um, I love her. And I'm not going to abandon her over that issue. Uh, we have to remember that people who hold positions that we may need in our coalition, um, we, we have to respect that they got there not by virtue of their hate or dislike or disrespect. And, and they may find themselves in groups where it's easy to exhibit disrespect, um, but they don't always, they don't, they don't all get there that way. And many of them are good people. I mean, I would say this too, like in thinking about what we're focused on and what we're doing, not just here, but in generally and broadly in a movement, what is our purpose as the left, so to speak? We are facing a crisis. I mean, we're talking the 21st century. What is in front of our face is every 28 hours, a black person in America is killed by a security guard, a police officer, or a vigilante. Every 28 hours, somebody dies. We don't have time to be able to sit here and hyper fix and focus on the one individual. We're talking about a climate crisis and catastrophe where whether we all like it or not, people in the global south are already being forced to migrate and move and losing their homes and losing their lives to a crisis produced by the first world and by the greed of corporations. We don't have time to waste. The U.S. is trying to w wage war on China, wage war on Russia. These are serious issues that could end up in nuclear war. And what I say that to say is that when we're talking about movements, we have to be talking and thinking in the millions. One or two people, that's okay. Let them be. Who are we trying to reach? Are we trying to reach every student that has a private university education? Or are we trying to reach poor and working people who right now are in the streets struggling because of inflation? So that's my question in a way to you, and it might not be an answer for what you're feeling in relationship to these individuals, but I think as an organizer, I think systemically, and I think about the big issues, and I think about the overarching structures and systems that we are facing and the urgency with which we must face them, and that means we can't get caught in the weeds of uh, uh, compromising what we know to be true, compromising what we know to be our values, and not just values, but honest to God truths that we live in a country that puts families in detention centers and separates them. That's inhuman and inhumane, and we I can't agree. accept that. So that's my point, is that I am not going to compromise my ideas because a couple of people you know, might not like them. I'm gonna find the people that do, and I do this work all the time. I talk to people all the time. I'm in the streets, I'm in the projects doing outreach, and people receive these completely differently than you will on a university campus. So that's just my thoughts. It's not to be, super extra, but it's to be honest about what I feel the urgency is. I need to, I'm sorry, but we have like hardworking people who've been here for a really long time that we can't really, this panel was supposed to be over six minutes ago, but we also have a student who wants to ask a question. And also you are all hardworking people who are here out of the goodness of your hearts and your political commitments. So if it's okay with you, can we have one more yes, student absolutely. question? Yeah, well, and Thank then you we'll, so much. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. This is, we've had the most student questions at this event of know, all of right? them, which is wonderful. <laughs> so we'll just make this the last question. Um, hi, so I'm a political science major at Hofstra University, and this is one of the key areas of why I wanted to be a political science major in the first place. Um, 
I'm a native to Long Island, and in my hometown especially, um, segregation is actually a really big issue, uh, especially in the school districts. Um, so my town is in Amityville. Whoever's familiar with Long Island knows where it is. Um, so the school district is 99% um, minority students, but the neighborhood um, is very divided. So where I live, it's 99% white. And um, all those students will go to private school. And the lack of diversity in the schools kind of puts this perception um, onto the communities that it's a bad education, it's filled with violence, drugs, gangs. Um, and you could see that in like, budget votes as well, as there's a lack of support for the community, um, the African American community uh, and Latino community as well. Um, and back in 2020, when we had the George Floyd protests and everything, um, I was one of the co-organizers along with some of my peers um, for a Black Lives Matter protest in the district. Um, and the amount of hatred that we received um, from people in our own neighborhood that you would think maybe were proclaimed allies or friends, um, was outrageous. We got things thrown at us. Um, you know, cars would be saying racial slurs and things as well. But um, what would you say to people in communities that think that these issues don't affect them, but as Long Island as a whole, it is very segregated? Um, so what would you say to them? Um, how can they be held accountable? And what can they do to potentially um, be more aware of these issues? Just as a quick point, I think you should be really proud of yourself. Yeah. You should feel, I mean, it's yeah. really important. It's not easy to organize on Long Island. I say this to everybody. I organize nationally and people all across the country dealing with people that organize in right wing areas. It's hard. It's hard to go and know that people want to enact violence against you for what you believe, but don't get lost in what they say. Think about the thousands of people on Long Island who mobilized. We had 10,000 people on Sunrise Highway in 2020. I never thought that was possible, frankly. So I think that just as a framing point of reference as a person to think about that power, that in some ways the majority, the people that really are out here, one in five people in the United States protested in 2020 for George Floyd, 20% of the population. That's a huge amount of people. So sometimes focusing on that can be very useful and very helpful. But I think to your actual question, there's, there's a lot. To, to people that say it doesn't impact them or infect them, it's not true. I mean, think about the kind of quality of education you get when you're in an all-white school district. I mean, studies show that black teachers are better teachers overall, period, because of what they bring to the table for both white students and students of color. I mean, there's a lot that you're missing out on. And when you're living in a segregated community, in a segregated world, what exactly is your life experience? And what happens when you lose everything, too? Because there's a lot of, of white people, especially from Long Island, who think they got it, think they're good forever. And then what happens when they're the ones who lose everything and their house gets foreclosed on? Because we're all part of the same class. We're all poor and working class people. And for people that have it a little bit better, they think they got a little bit better, but that's not forever. So I think that's the only way to, to really answer it. It's hard to win people over to that idea if they can't directly see it. But sometimes when you see those moments in their lives where something changes, I think you can draw those connections. Thank you. I'm just going to say one quick thing. I know we're, we're, we're over time here, but um, I think so often the way our politics are framed here is for, it's always about how do you reach you know that person on the other side, right? Yeah. And I actually think you have to reach the people who you don't even know where they are. Like, I think that that is what we're after because, like, when we think about electoral politics, I think about the people who aren't voting because they're actually our biggest block. What is preventing them? Who isn't speaking to them? And what is missing from our dialogue? I think so often we only look at the people who are out front and loud. And I guess I would be an out front and loud <laughs> person too. But, you know, like, who are my neighbors? And, like, did they vote in the last election? And if so, why not? You know, like, was it just they felt that nobody spoke to them? And maybe that's who we need to be talking to. You know, I think that so often we're just trying to look at the other side as if, as if compromising with fascists would be a win. Because it's not. I mean, and maybe that's how we wrap up the, com the conference. Don't compromise with fascists. <laughs>